Great to be with you, John. Are you used to being called Your Excellency or? Uh, absolutely not. No? Think that'll ever happen? <laughs> Probably not. Okay. I, um, I'm grateful to be governor. You know, I feel really privileged to be doing this job, and it's been a fast and furious three weeks. Yeah, I bet. I bet. Well, thanks for coming by. We appreciate it. So it's been kind of a tough week this past week in Woburn. Uh, where the teachers have been out on strike all week. These teacher strikes are illegal in Massachusetts and 37 other states, but the state's largest teacher union, the Mass Teachers Association, which endorsed your candidacy, says they plan to file legislation to allow strikes. Do you think that's a good idea? Um, I, I don't. And, you know, I come to this, John, as the proud daughter of educators. I think we should be doing everything we can to support our educators, particularly in this time and, and what so many have been through with COVID, uh, a lot of strain on, on our educators, also a lot of strain on our kids and families. And so every day when I see kids out of school because of a strike, you know, my heart just breaks because kids have been through enough in terms of learning loss and the like. And so, you know, my strong encouragement has been to resolve this labor matter. Let's get the kids back in school. Let's give them what they need and find ways, of course, to support our educators and our schools. And that means everything, John, from providing uh, more modern school buildings and facilities. Importantly, it also means providing mental health and other wraparound services for our students as well as for our educators. So if a bill allowing teacher strikes were to land on your desk, it would probably encounter a veto? I'm not a fan. You know, there's yeah. a reason why that is in place. And while I have a lot of sympathy and want to make sure that workers, in this case educators, are getting paid uh, what they should uh, for the important work that they do, it's still paramount that our kids be in school. Now, the teacher unions also want to do away with the MCAS test as a graduation requirement and allow every school district in the state to set their own standards. Does that strike you as a good idea? I think what's important is that we take a hard look at MCAS. I certainly don't dispute or want to do away with an assessment, an ability to assess how well a child is, is doing because we want to make sure that we're we're working with that student to help them advance. And you also so, want to see where the bad teachers are. Well, I think it's important that we have the assessment, or, or assessment tools yeah. in place and that we are assessing the right things. You know, a lot has changed in education from the time that you and I went to school. And so I am open to uh, looking at what we're actually measuring, what we're actually assessing with MCAS. I think that's important. Uh, can you expand on that a little bit? What do you mean? What's wrong with what MCAS access, uh, uh, assesses now? Well, I think the question is, what else should MCAS be assessing? We talk a lot about social emotional learning. We talk a lot these days about what it is that our young students actually need to excel in today's world. As you know, think of the, the, the advent of remote work. Think about the, the way we exchange with one another. Think about the role of technology in our lives. There are a lot of things that I think we need to make sure we're giving our young people in terms of curricula. In addition to, really importantly, John, I'm coming back to this, mental health supports in our school. Yeah, this is interesting to me because uh, the uh president of the Mass Teachers Association, Max Page, testified before the Board of Education uh, a few months back that uh, the whole concept of turning out students who are ready to hire is all wrong. We should be focusing on nurturing their creativity, dealing with their emotional well-being and so forth, and that uh, this is just providing more fodder for the capitalist system. I'm paraphrasing him, but that's the gist of what he said. What did you think when you heard that? Well, I think we can and should do both. We want to do everything to nurture the intellectual growth of our young people. We want to support their social emotional development and we want to make sure they are ready for the world, right? So these are not mutually exclusive prerogatives by any stretch. Well, along with public education, the other big beneficiary of the so-called millionaire's tax that passed last fall uh, is supposed to be transportation. In your opinion, does the MBTA need more money? And if so, what for? Well, right now, the MBTA needs workers. I'll tell you that. We are down several hundred positions across the MBTA. And, you know, I'm somebody who believes we are not going to have a functioning economy unless we have a functioning public transit system. 
it needs to be safe, it needs to be reliable. And one way we get there is by having the workforce. Right now, we're down. Well, you're absolutely. I, they they have fallen, last I saw, 350 drivers short of the full complement of bus drivers. If it's not a money issue, what is the problem? Private sector bus companies seem to be able to staff up. Well, you know, that's something that we're looking at right now. And it's not just bus drivers, it's dispatchers. It really covers a range of, of positions at the T. And I was just touring the operations center there the other day. And there's so many people, John, who are there doing great work, doing important work. But, you know, for me, safety is key. It's why I've run a really tight process. We hope to be announcing a new GM soon. Also, I'm calling for and will appoint our state's first transportation safety chief. You know, we've got to get this right. In addition to workforce, John, it's also about getting trains delivered on time. Our red and orange line, the fleet is too old. Uh, we've got to accelerate and expedite the production and, and the delivery of those trains. Are there elements of the T management structure that might perform better if they were turned over to private sector operation? I don't believe private sector operation. I do believe that all of that does deserve a look. And one of the things I called for during the campaign, and of course we're only three weeks in, but already I've said we're going to have a, a, a new GM. We're going to have a new first time safety chief. We're going to also split off the departments that plan capital planning, right, for, for projects from operations because we haven't paid enough attention to the actual operations side of things. So all of that deserves a close look and that's something that this administration is very much engaged in now. Well, everything you're telling me seems to speak to management failures, um, chronic management failures. And I don't think that's a secret to anyone who follows the, the story of the T. Um, just to be crystal clear about it, is privatization off the table as far as you're concerned or not? Right now, I'm focused on building and strengthening the workforce within the T because we are down 900 positions at the T. That has a direct effect on how many trains and buses we can run, how often we can run them, and how on time they are, in addition to how safe conditions are. And so that has to be, as governor, my first focus, safety and getting there through the workforce. And certainly, we will be an administration open to exploring whatever it is we need to do so that we have a public transit system that is safe and reliable. Uh, you've said you support calls for a Boston seat on the MBTA board. That would be the first time, I believe, that a board seat has been designated for a specific geographic part of the MBTA service area. Why not a Metro West seat or, or North Shore seat and so on? Well, I think Boston disproportionately, it's, it's the, the capital city, the largest city, you know, within the T service area makes sense. Whether or not there's some other changes to contemplate, again, we're, we're just getting started here. We'll see. We'll see. But the key, I think, to any board is you want to have a board that is well-functioning, that really represents the interests of, of ridership, um, that really represents the interests those, of those who actually are depending on people, whether it's, you know, coming in as employees or, or, um, or otherwise. And so that should be the focus of, of establishing any board. You want to get the right representation in place. All right. Much, much more to get to. Many important topics to cover. Let's take a quick break. And when we continue, we'll talk more with the governor of the Commonwealth, Maura Healy. So please stay with us. Welcome back to our conversation with Governor Maura Healy. Governor, the, the three most magical words that you'll hear during the course of your administration, let's talk sewage, okay? <laughs> There's a huge uproar right now on the South Coast and Cape Cod about new regulations proposed by the state that would require many homeowners to spend large amounts of money, tens of thousands of dollars, on upgrading their septic systems. This is all about curbing nitrogen damage to waterways. Now, critics say the state has done a poor job of listening and responding to their concerns about the way this is being rolled out. And the new rules could wind up driving middle and working class homeowners out of their homes. 
What steps, if any, are you going to take to address those concerns? Yeah, so this is something, John, that I just learned about starting uh, starting in office. These were rules the state had put out under the prior administration. And so we're coming into this now, and we're going to have a series of public hearings on this and take comment from the public to do that kind of community engagement, the community listening that you speak of. I'm very sensitive to a couple of things. Sure, I'm sensitive to the environment, and we need to continue to take steps in this state to make sure we're addressing environmental pollution and preserve our, our natural habitat, right? That's important. It's also the case that a lot of people are struggling right now. They are struggling, you know, with the co everything from the cost of eggs to the cost of gas, uh, certainly to, to, to high costs associated with, with a septic system repair. And so my office will be very sensitive to that as we think about what a final rule should actually look like. Well, it's my understanding the, the hearing process is almost totally complete now. And the ruling, you know, the new rules are ready to go. Just conceptually, as you look at this, is this some, uh, is this a situation where the state needs to step in with funding to help subsidize these kind of repairs? Or, or does the state do, do the state environmental bureaucrats need to be reined in a little bit? Well, I think that what's important is this isn't final. So we, okay. we've come in. Um, again, we just started three weeks ago. Our team learned about this. We're in discussions with community members, with electeds in the area, and we're sensitive absolutely to the need to, to address the reality that these things will cost money. So what's the solution? What's the path forward? That's something that my team is focused on right now. So throughout the campaign, since you've been in office, you've made it clear that the affordable housing crisis is, if not job one, job 1A for you going forward. How can we make a dent in the affordable housing crisis when developers, both nonprofit and for-profit, are deterred from building multifamily projects with more than 90 bedrooms in them? Because when you build the 91st bedroom, it triggers a state requirement of very expensive wastewater treatment systems. Well, here's what we need to do around housing, and you are absolutely right, John. It is the number one priority for our administration. It's why I established um, and we'll be filing legislation to create a secretary of housing so that we have a whole secretariat whose sole job it is to increase the number of housing units across the state. We need to bring down costs, rents, as well as home prices by creating more homes. Simply put, building more homes. So whatever the barriers are, whatever the disincentive are, disincentives are for the developers, right. we need to change that. And it needs to be a community process too, a community engagement process. We need to work with our towns and municipalities to demonstrate the value proposition that more housing creates for our state. Massachusetts is the greatest state in the country, but we're gonna lose out to other states if people can't afford to live here, if they can't afford to stay here, if businesses can't afford to stay here because they can't employ people here, right? So, you know, this becomes not only a question of affordability for individual families, but also a question of Massachusetts competitiveness, which is why we need such urgency and such intentionality around driving housing production around this state. Environmentalists aren't going to like you tampering with these regs. Well, I guess I disagree on that because here's the thing. We have an opportunity to rehab housing in a way that's more environmentally friendly, sustainable, resilient. We have an opportunity to build more housing units right now in ways that are also sustainable and resilient. So it can, <clears throat> it can be a win-win, and that's part of what we've got to get out and get after and have this very public conversation about. It is going to require extensive public-private partnership to get this done, and we're going to need to do something, John, that we have not done before as a state to get to the goal we need to meet. You're not happy with the status quo. Absolutely Is that fair to not. say? Okay, so given that, and given your emphasis on accelerating the development of affordable housing, um, 
are you comfortable keeping on Baker era appointees to, at, for instance, a crucial agency like the Mass Housing Finance Agency? Uh, Crystal Cornegay and her team over there have presided over this unacceptable pace of housing development. Should, should they be buffing up their resumes? Absolutely not. I mean, the fact of the matter is housing um, is built by a number of different entities, agencies, public, private. What we need, John, now and what a secretary of housing will bring is somebody to bring folks together to drive that momentum forward. There are a lot of great people throughout state government, throughout local government um, and throughout the public private sector who have been working hard in this space. Right now, it's about, you know, not assigning blame, but really recognizing the status quo doesn't work. So so let's change it up and let's go forward. And that's going to be done through public-private partnership and investment, as well as conversations with communities around the value proposition of more housing. You know, speaking of Governor Baker, before we, we take our next break here, outgoing governors routinely make dozens of 11th hour appointments to boards and agencies, and routinely their successors rescind many of them. That's just the way it's always worked. Uh, the Globe reported the other day that you haven't rescinded any of Baker's 169 appointments that he made in the final days of his administration. Why? I don't think it's uncommon for outgoing governors to make those appointments. Yeah. I know Governor Patrick did the same and probably Governor Romney yeah. before him. And of those appointments, there are very few that are actually eligible for rescission. Kim Driscoll and I have been very focused on our agenda, uh, setting up our team, setting up our cabinets so that we can get out and get after what is a really robust agenda. So we're hard at work with that. There'll be plenty of appointments uh, to come, but really uh, I'm looking forward to working with folks across this administration to try to move us forward. And you didn't, when you checked into the governor's office, find any, you know, half burned documents in the fireplace did you <laughs> no, no that's old timers will get that reference to some funny business that used to happen no uh, governor baker left everything in beautiful uh, beautiful shape at his office there and uh, we are uh, i'm still in the process of of uh, unpacking boxes and, and moving in all right on that note tell you what let's take our next break and we'll continue our conversation with governor moore healy in just a moment stay with us please Welcome back. We're talking about as many of the big issues of the day as we can get to with the governor of the Commonwealth, Moore Healy. The governor, when the rise in state revenues last year triggered those tax rebates under a 1986 law that had been passed by the voters, you were very vocal in insisting that the legislature comply with the law and give that money back. And that's exactly what happened. Does that also mean that going forward now, you oppose what some legislators have suggested, repeal or change of that law for the future? You know, I'm not, I'm not focused on that discussion because right now, John, I'm focused on what's our consensus revenue number, meaning what have we agreed is the pot of money, essentially, that we have available for budgeting, and what is that first budget going to look like? Uh, we're in a much better financial fiscal situation than we have been in um, in, in many years. Um, and so for me and my team, it's about important conversations right now with legislative leadership over how we're going to strategically use and invest those funds. Well, uh, House Speaker Mariano, Ron Mariano, at the time last summer when this surfaced, uh, stirred up a lot of controversy by claiming that, well, you know, this this is risky business now. We're considering a billion dollar tax package that the governor had proposed and that you mostly support. Uh, we can't do both. That's too risky uh, uh, given the revenue outlook. And he's turning out, based on that consensus revenue estimate, to be kind of prophetic. Uh, if the legislature had passed that package that I just referred to, uh, we'd be looking at negative revenue growth this year based on the consensus forecast. Does that give you pause about support for tax cuts going forward? You know, we've been busy crunching the numbers the last few weeks, and um, that led us to do a couple of important things. One, 
to issue, uh, and, and I signed a bill that would essentially provide close to a billion dollars important money out there for bond authorizations so that we can have money for housing. We spoke about the importance of that, infrastructure, workforce development, economic development. So that's very important for the growth of this state. I also put forward another $400 million proposal for bridges and roads, uh, basic infrastructure around the state. So we know there is money there. Obviously, we're going to be working very closely the next few weeks on a budget. And I hope that we're able to arrive at a place uh, collectively together with the legislature on how best to spend that money. There is money there. It importantly needs to be used to, to, to support the things that people really need right now. Housing, workforce, economic development. And finally, we're going to have some receipts in from the Fair Share Amendment, which I think everybody has agreement on, are to be allocated for education and infrastructure, which was the will of the voters. So I'm hearing those things take priority over tax cuts. Correct. I, I still support tax relief. I did during the campaign and I do as governor. And I believe that there is a way to provide targeted tax relief uh, to folks in this state. You talk about uh, expanding sort of the, the senior circuit breaker, providing relief to lower income folks, to renters, providing a, chi a child tax credit. That's something that I've been supportive of for a long time, as well as making an adjustment to the estate tax. So I'm hopeful, I'm confident. I'm hopeful uh, that we can get to a place where we're making strategic investments through the budget, of course, and also providing tax relief to folks around the state. That's a good politic answer, but my question was about priorities. Is it fair to say that all those areas of need do take priority over the tax relief as much as you might want to do the tax relief? I think the good news is we can do both. Based on the numbers I'm seeing, we can okay. do both. All right. Okay. Um, speaking of taxes, Proposition 2.5, of course, is famous. That's the local property tax limitation. Your local government is limited to 2.5% plus uh, in a few other areas. Uh, uh, so it limits how much your tax bill can grow in any given year. Um, there, there are always proposals on Beacon Hill to repeal two and a half, to amend it, to run end runs about it. Well, now that inflation is running so far ahead of two and a half percent, a lot of municipalities are, are in a real budget crunch. Do, are you open to the idea of tinkering with Prop two and a half? Well, I recognize the pain out there. Um, I, re I recognize what a lot of uh, challenges our, our cities and towns are up against. Uh, you know, as a general matter, I'll review anything that comes to my desk. Right now, I'm very much focused on what we can do, how we can provide relief through this budgeting cycle. Um, I mentioned the bond bill that I filed. I mentioned the, the Chapter 90 funding bill that I filed. I also filed a bill for some supplemental funding uh, to help with, with the crunch both of uh, emergency shelters and what, what the need is out there, also housing, also school meal, meals. Um, because our schools and, and districts have needed assistance there. So, you know, all of these will, will require continued conversation, and my hope is that we can work through this together. I, I noted with interest uh, that uh, you are beefing up the state's presence in Washington, right? What exactly is it you're doing or, or lobbying? presence down there? Well, um, I haven't hired anyone yet, but I've been really clear that I want folks in my administration focused, dog on bone, yeah. on federal funds yeah. to make sure that through our grant applications, we are going after and chasing and trying to maximize federal dollars coming into our state. Well, let me ask you about that, because um, we've all been reading about how we fanned on the first couple of rounds of federal funding for repair of the Bourne and Sagamore bridges down the Cape. Uh, and this is uh, a matter of urgent need. Uh, Senators Warren and Markey say that the state bungled the application process, basically. They, they didn't handle it property, properly to get the federal funds. Congressman Lynch was sitting where you are a couple of weeks ago. He said, no, the problem is the state was asking for double the amount that we really need. Who's right? Well, I think on this, um, what's important here 
for folks to know. I've spoken with the delegation. I've spoken with Senator Warren. Uh, I've spoken with Congressman Lynch. I think a few things need to happen. One, you know, this is something that is somewhat of a joint venture between the state, the Army Corps, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and also uh, the federal government. Um, I am working right now on reaching out to not only our delegation, we've had good conversations about this, but our team within the Department of Transportation, as well as the U.S. Army Corps, as well as the U.S. Department of Transportation, because I want to make sure that an application under my administration is in uh, great shape, that it is in the best form it can be, that will maximize the chance of our receiving those funds. Do, do you think Lynch has a point? I think Congressman Lynch uh, raised that with me, and I think it's worth looking at. Maybe the $4 billion price tag is too high. That would be a that would be a nice scenario, right? If yeah. if it actually were not to cost that much, and you know, therefore achieving financing might be might be that much easier. But this is an important issue, John. It's important. It's important infrastructure for our state. These bridges, we've got to get them fixed. Um, we're just about out of time. Why don't you take the last thirty seconds and explain to me what so far has emerged as the biggest difference between your old job and your new one? <laughs> Um, you know, probably, um, well, there are so, so many things. Um, I'm called, I'm called governor, although I was at the city, state of the city event the other night and somebody called out general and both Andrea Campbell and I turned around at the same time. So I'm still, still getting used to that. Um, but you know, there, there are a lot more folks around. There are bigger teams, bigger agencies. And with that, hopefully comes a capability to, to do more things. Um, I'm getting used to a different drive-in, um, and uh, you know, turning uh, turning right into the state house instead of left into Ashburton. Um, I miss the Ashburton Cafe. There's no cafeteria yeah. right now in the state house. Those are some of the uh, differences. Well, there's our headline from this interview. Healy admits she's turning right. <laughs> Only you would be able to get that out of me, John. Thanks Good for to being see here, you. Governor. Good to <laughs> thank come you. back again thank soon. You. We appreciate it. And thank you very much for joining us. Now, if you missed part of this interview and want to watch the whole thing, it's available on demand here on our website, cbsboston.com. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Now it's back to my colleagues for more CBS News Boston.